Hello. Welcome to the THC Show. I'm your host, Neil Magnuson. This is the THC Show for Truth, Hope, and Change. Well, also for THC, because the truth, the hope, and the change that we're hoping for is all surrounding THC, and boy, do we ever need some of that, all of that. On the show today, we'll have 8 out of 10 Glenn, as always, for the 420 session, and uh, we will do our regular visit, but it won't be to the RV, it'll be to the Healing Wave CSP tent. And that has to be the lead story uh, on today's show, is that we no longer have the CSP RV. Uh, we have been under attack for the last uh, few weeks. There's been uh, several break-ins into the RV. There's never anything there to steal, but they always make a hell of a mess. On Friday morning, Remembrance Day, we woke up to finding the uh, side window of the RV smashed. The following morning, I uh, went out to the RV to find that the cardboard that I had taped over the hole had been uh, disrupted. And upon looking in, in through the cardboard, there was somebody inside the van making themselves quite at home, doing hard drugs. Uh, the place was a complete disaster again. And I kicked them out and sent them on their way and told them to never come back again. That night, one of my staff volunteered to stay overnight in the RV. At two o'clock in the morning, he heard someone pulling on the back door. The third big pull resulted in the door opening and in stepped someone who was surprised to see somebody in there and uh, ran away on his longboard. But on the way away from his longboard, he yelled back, next time I come by, I'm going to firebomb your RV. Lots of people say lots of things in this neighborhood. I didn't really take that completely seriously. I mean, how could we? What would we do? How do we know? But that night, 10 minutes after we locked up the RV, uh, somebody did throw a Molotov cocktail. They, they pried open the back door again, threw in a Molotov cocktail, and set the RV on fire. We didn't know about it. We were inside the shop until we heard the sirens. 20 minutes after we closed up, we went to investigate the sirens only to find fire trucks surrounding the RV and trying to put out what was a major blaze. So we're not sure what to do at this point because we're not sure why that happened. Right now we're operating under a tent like we did before when the VPD seized our RV. Can't stay under the tent for very long. It's not sustainable at winter in the winter time or at any time really. But we're going to be there for a little while, for a few days, maybe for a week. Thankfully, and you know, very humbling, I've had numerous people step forward and offer me vehicles and other things. The outpouring of support has been incredible, very moving for sure. I was in tears today because the medicinal cannabis dispensary, one of our original donators way back in the day, gave me an incredible donation to help us get another RV. We likely will. First, I'm waiting. I'm going to wait a few days. I want to see if the police find out anything, for one thing, but I'm not expecting them to. This was a professional job. What I do think might happen is that the information might be out there on the street. This neighborhood supports us greatly. Many people have come forward to tell me that they're going to be finding out who did this. That may or may not help us, but I want to know. Either way, we're going to put another vehicle back there. A little hesitant to put another vehicle back there only to have it firebombed again. So when we put another vehicle back out there and continue our operations from the vehicle, we'll have uh, round-the-clock security when we're not there. We'll have overnight security of people, someone at the RV, not sleeping in it, but there to see and to deter anybody from uh, doing such things again. The list of suspects is large but confined to basically a couple of different potential groups. This is not an attempt to steal from us, it's an attempt to make us go away. What we're doing here is we're trying to help people get off of the hard drugs through high dose cannabis edibles. We're trying to provide an option for people who are using those drugs and addicted to those drugs, or just those people that really need to have cannabis in their life, an inexpensive option. 
So those people that don't want to lose their customers to hard drugs, or maybe those people who want to sell cannabis at high prices aren't happy about us. That's the only thing that makes sense. I mean, it could be something else, but realistically, the only ones who are going to profit off of us not being here are those two groups that I mentioned. It is really a sad day. What this really is, is an indictment of the federal government. A federal government who is criminally derelict in their responsibilities during a public health emergency to support what has been demonstrated and proven to be the best harm reduction option that there is. It's unconscionable that they would leave us high and dry, hanging out in the, in the outside in an RV and not provide us and the people that we're serving the dignity of having a storefront and the security that that offers. A federal government delinquent in their responsibilities has also allowed us to be raided, to have our medicine that was meant for this neighborhood seized, to have myself and two of my colleagues charged with selling cannabis without a license. My goodness. Selling cannabis without a license. Selling cannabis without a license because those that have licenses to sell cannabis have to sell it at extremely high artificially inflated prices. Selling cannabis without a license because we were told we would get licenses. We were told by the city of Vancouver after passing a motion unanimously to support low barrier access because of what we were doing that they would support us. That they would come and, if we found a storefront and moved our project off the sidewalk, nice of them, eh? For three and a half years, we toiled on the sidewalk out front of Van Du, providing care packs to hundreds of people that would line up for hours to get them. Through winter, summer, snow, heat, rain, wind, you name it. And even if it was just beautiful, beautiful weather every day, they were, they were allowing hundreds of people to have to line up for hours just to get a small amount of what they refused to provide for people in their stores. Most of those people had mobility issues. Very, very difficult to stand in a lineup for a few hours, yet they did it. A testament to how, value, how valuable our service was to them. And where was the government? Sure. The municipal government did pass that motion two and a half years after we first presented the idea to them. After I stood before council with a package of edibles held up and stating clearly this is the safe supply. This is what should be supported. This is what the neighborhood needs. They refused to talk to me or do anything about it for two and a half years. But we demonstrated it every time we were there for all of that time that no one is harmed by this, and many people are helped profoundly by this. Many of those people will tell you that what we've done has saved their life. We hear it all the time here. Thank you. You've saved my life. So many people now tell me that they were there, they did do those hard drugs, but now they're just using cannabis. And it's not us, but it's cannabis that saved their life. Where is the government? Finally, the city passes a motion because M.J. Malloy did studies on what we were doing there and, and wrote peer-reviewed papers that spoke to the efficacy and the safety of what we were doing. So because of that, city council passes a motion to support us. We met with the city when they did that. Myself, Jody Emery, a member of the Van Du Board, a member of the Green Cross Board, had a very good meeting. Councillor Bly was all in favor of what we were doing. She has a mother who relies on high-dose cannabis edibles that she can't get anywhere unless she makes them herself or has friends make them. So she was in favor of what we were doing and supported us. A very good meeting that ended with an understanding that we would find a storefront, that they would then support us in that storefront. We kept up our end of the deal. We got, we got a storefront. It took us about a year because storefronts are very hard to get in Vancouver when you're going to be providing cannabis there. All the landlords and their lawyers know all about dispensaries. 
They know all about the threats from the government, the seizures of property, the big fines that they get every day. They don't want to, don't want to rent to anybody that's going to be providing cannabis without a license. We found someone who loved what we were doing and was willing to rent to us, who I promised that we would get a license to. However, rather than city staff coming and assessing us to give us a license, we had city licensing come and say, oh no, it doesn't matter what city council did. We don't know and we don't care about a motion to support low barrier access without a license. Told us we had to go through the provincial government and get a license first. Pretty quickly we knew it wasn't the provincial government that was going to give us a license. It had to be Health Canada. So we put in an application to Health Canada. An amazing application. <coughs> John Conroy spent hours and hours and hours discussing with me, writing emails, crafting this application. It's bulletproof. We knew it was bulletproof. We knew that we had all the evidence there because we included the science. We included the testimonials of dozens of people that had used our services and benefited from it. We put together an application that any high school student would have taken about two hours to assess and then definitely decide that we needed to be supported in what we were doing. We submitted that to Health Canada in September two years ago. We, su we, su we submitted that application to Health Canada and to Patty Haydu, the federal health minister at the time. Both of those divisions or departments told us that uh, they had received our application and they would do their best to respond in a timely fashion. Well, it was months before we heard back from either of them. Did I mention we also sent in an application with, along with that for an emergency temporary exemption from the Cannabis Act to protect us in the meantime? Also, no response. Three months later, in December, Health Canada requested a meeting with my lawyers and ourself and myself. In that meeting, they apologized for taking too long, three months. They said that probably they would have licenses for us in early January. This will be the third January coming up. Still no sign of a license, still no sign of an exemption. What we have had from Health Canada are excuses and delays and more excuses and more delays. Right now, the ball's in their court. They supplied us with a letter saying their intent was to deny our application. Really? You have an application to provide a service that's been ongoing for years and saving people's lives, and without it people will die, and you're going to deny that application? They said that was their intent. The reasons for their intent to deny our application were that, one, we weren't using all legal cannabis even though we had suggested in our application that they should license those trusted suppliers of ours for the last number of years. And if not, that there's a lot of cannabis that's according to them safe, grown under their regulations by licensed producers that's being destroyed daily. Tons of it. They could divert that to programs like ours. It's not hard for us to have a completely legal supply, if that's what they insist they could legalize our supply. That's the position they're in. After all, we're dealing with the Special Exemptions and Licensing Division of Health Canada, Mr. Benoit Seguin in charge. The second reason they have, and there's only two, but the second reason that they gave us that they don't want to give us a license, their intent is to deny, is because I won't only provide cannabis to people that have a doctor on board with them. That would eliminate about 95 plus percent of the people that we've been helping for years here. We would have to say, sorry, go get yourself a doctor or tough titties to you. So sad, too bad, you don't get it. Really? That's a non-human solution to a very human problem. And we are really human beings here. And we can't comply to that. So we sent to Health, back to Health Canada a detailed, long, extensive group of reasons 
why we need to be able to continue to provide low barrier access to Canadians who need it to beat their addiction. And we wait, and we wait, and we wait. Over two years waiting for Health Canada to approve our application, including our application for an emergency exemption. We needed that exemption. We needed the application approved so that we could bring people back into a safe space so that we could have security for my staff and whatever suppliers we were allowed to use. We needed that. But we didn't get it. We're still waiting. And while we have been waiting, not just waiting, of course, like I said, we're human beings who care. We cannot and will not turn our backs on all of these people who have been relying on us for all these time, all this time who come to us daily and thank us for what we're doing and tell us how valuable it is in their life. People that we've been helping for years. We've been doing this for almost six years. All the people in the program, 250 plus of them, are people that lined up at Van Du. We've known them for years. We've watched them come to us drug sick and progress out of their addiction into lives that are meaningful and worth living. They come and tell us their stories. We are an ear for them. We care. They are family. We are family. It's 419. I need so much more time to discuss what's going on here. But we're going to take a break. In any case, we've gone through winters and heat domes, incredible heat, nasty cold, and all kinds of other things that have befallen us because we're out in an RV instead of a storefront like everybody else gets to be in. Much harm has happened as a result. Not to mention the fact that we're limited in what we can do in that RV. We are limited in what's going on because we don't have a license from Health Canada. I'm limited in the people that will come and help me here because they're concerned about their, their future and getting a criminal record. Several of our good volunteers that would like to help us have had to say, I can't risk it. I need to be able to enroll in school down the road, or I need to be able to travel, or I, I can't have a criminal record, or I have a child that I'm, that I'm afraid I might lose. They have handcuffed us and hindered us in dramatic ways for all this time. And now we've had our RV torched. There could have easily been someone in that RV. They could be responsible for murder, if that's the case. But they are responsible for murder because our lack of ability to expand our program to reach all the people that need to be reached has meant that many, many, many people have died of this poison drug supply that didn't need to. Health Canada is on trial here. We'll see where it goes. It's 4.20 and we nearly need to take a break. Boy, I'll tell you, do we ever need to take the sacred herb and have a break. Glenn Wells is here as always. Been my guest for over three years now, coming to the show and helping out with uh, what we're doing here. <laughs> you don't have to move. I can, <laughs> I can follow the eye. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I've got to have to do so that. Glenn is, not, Glenn is not just my 420 guest anymore. Oh. He's now also the producer of the show. Yeah. Uh, Anil was great, but he's gone to India. Yep. Good luck, to Anil. I hope you're watching. Yeah, me too. We good miss you. Good luck. But not that much, because Glenn's doing a great job. <laughs> I'm always here. Back. I miss Anil. I miss him. Too. I hope he's okay. I miss him too. Happy 420, happy 420, happy 420, yeah. Light him if oh, you got him. Another thing you were asking what we could talk about, uh, mm. Pat's thing is coming up on Friday. That's right. Right, so we can talk about that. And apparently, um, the other two Although, have been offered a deal from the Crown. We don't know what the deal is is yet, but they, because they had other charges, like one, the other one, I think Jesse or something, may have had possession of cocaine uh, at the time, so they can't get rid of that charge, but there's apparently a sweet heart deal in, in the making for those two people, so. Well, we'll see, and, that, and that's what I was going to say, is really we, we can't comment too much about what's yeah. going to happen there. 
um, until it happens. Which is um, Friday. On Friday, it's yeah. the, the 18th. They're going to have the uh, I don't know what they call it, to, but anyway, they're going to they're going to they're going to go a, through the it's exercise. A pre -trial it's a pretrial conference, yeah. but in yeah. this pretrial conference, they're going to have armed with that constitutional challenge win that they got that says that Canadians have a constitutional right to be able to go into a storefront. Um, and they have a constitutional right to be able to access high-dose cannabis products. So they should have those charges dismissed. My goodness, they should have those charges dismissed. If this was a real just world here and reason was the thing that drove the day, then those dispensary owners would be given medals, pats on the back, yeah. a thank you for doing the right thing in the face of the government doing the wrong thing. The fact that now the government's allowing cannabis to be sold in stores means that it was never wrong to sell cannabis mm -hmm. in the stores. It was never wrong, no. And it was always wrong for them to be not allowing people to have cannabis in their life, for the government to think that it's okay to prohibit this plant. Right there. To know. prohibit Canadians right from having a plant. Yeah, They're smoking the plant. A plant that grows wild in many places. You know, Adela Wisdom down in Missouri, mm -hmm. was charged with possession of hemp. Oh, wow. Really? Because yeah. there was some wild hemp growing on her property. Oh, wow. I've huh. seen the evidence. It's disgusting. Just a little pile of a bunch of lousy cannabis. They have spent over a million dollars trying to persecute her. Oh, I wonder if a uh, million Biden's dollars. new thing will get let her off of that. I wonder. Well, they're, they're in the states. They're in yeah. Missouri. Oh yeah. Or oh, with Biden's. Biden's. Things. Yes, Biden's right. I mean, he's... Well, they haven't even got a decision yet. No. She's been in court for months now. Wow. It's been dragging on for years. Wow. It's just the most stupid thing. But it's not the only stupid thing. It's one of a whole bunch of stupid things. Mm -hmm. What did they spend? What did What did the federal crown spend of our precious tax dollars to have Jerry and Pat and Jason win their constitutional challenge? How much money did they spend on the lawyers? How much money has been wasted to try to persecute these good people that own dispensaries in the face of bad laws to help poor sick people that needed it? How much money have they wasted? Millions. How much are they wasting on us now? Mr. Benoit Seguin of the Special Licensing and Exemption Division of Health Canada, whose job it is to give exemptions, he says, for these last <coughs> two plus years since we've submitted that application, he has said that his team has been working diligently on our file ever since they got it. <laughs> what is that costing taxpayers? And what is the point of all of that? What is the point of all of that? They're just trying to deny our license. They're wasting all of those Canadian tax dollars that they're paying to Mr. Benoit Seguin and his team. And all they're trying to do is to figure out how to say no to us. Mm -hmm. Because we put in an application that's bulletproof, that doesn't allow for them to say no without them saying, we're okay with people dying of fentanyl. That's what they're wasting all that money on. Now we got the federal crown coming after us for selling cannabis without a license. How much are they wasting on that? Tomorrow we're in court. 222 Main Street. If you're in Vancouver, please come out and support us. It's great to have a whole bunch of people in the courtroom that all stand up in unison and walk out when the case is now moved to another date. It's great to have that. If you're here, please come. Nine o'clock. Nine o'clock. It'll, the court starts at 9.30, but of course you want to be here at 9 o'clock to join us out front for a Wait session you. of the sacred herb. <laughs> How much are they wasting on that? How much does it cost to keep a courtroom open, to heat it, to light it, to pay for the stenographers, the sheriffs, the, the, the judge and the prosecutors, and everybody's getting paid there out of our tax dollars. And for what? And for what? I was chatting with the my co-accused George's lawyer today, who says this is all crazy. That if she was the judge, she would completely dismiss it immediately as soon as she saw what was going on. Yeah. And I believe that's what's going to happen in this pre-trial conference. Hopefully. But it, it's all just nuts. 
It's all just a bunch of people, you know, sucking on the tit of the taxpayer for no good reason whatsoever. It wouldn't take much of a half, a, half, a half an ounce of brain to figure out that we're not criminals. No. We're not here hurting this community. We're saving them. We've got no victims in our wake. We've got hundreds and hundreds of people that we've helped. And that's our mission. That's our goal. That's what we care about. All of my volunteers here are dedicated people who care about what we're doing. Health, or the federal crown can't figure that out without having to go to court. They don't have, they just need to talk to me. They just need to come down here and have a look, talk to any one of my volunteers. There is no need for this wasting of our precious tax dollars to bring us before a judge to see if he thinks we should be punished for doing our best to respond to a public health emergency for the last almost six years. And they think you should be punished. Six months and a cease, yeah. cease and desist order, right? So, yeah. Corruption. It is. Absolute corruption. Stop saving people's lives. We're going to tell you not to do that anymore. So I said it when I first so started. Fucked up when you say it. You know, I mean, I've been, fight, I've been fighting this corrupt government for many, many years. Almost 20 years now. Well, at, at the time, so I'm, so I'm going back six years. So six years ago, I've been fighting this corrupt government about their stupid prohibition or attempt to prohibit cannabis mm -hmm. for almost 20 years. I did what I did in the way that I did it to prevent exactly what's happening here, to expose what's going on. I said at that time, we are going to either get low barrier access availability for people to cannabis, or we're going to expose a federal government that is so corrupt that it is willing to allow all these people to die mm -hmm. to keep their artificially high prices in their stores going on. And to keep pharmaceutical companies and happy. And to keep pharmaceutical companies happy and all yeah. the rest of the lobbyists who don't want cannabis to compete with in this world. Hmm. Cannabis has never done anything wrong. No, nope. it just makes you live longer. It helps in so many ways. I know, hey. They tried, to, they tried to say it has no medical value. In fact, in the United States, it's in that category. Schedule one, no medicinal value possible. Well, really? I, really? I haven't had a flu or a cold in so many years, so tell me cannabis is not keeping me healthy. I'm in my 50th year of smoking weed. Yeah. Maybe it was this day, 50 years ago, that yeah. I was first, I think it was in the summertime, though, yeah. that I was first walking down that road. I can still see it. I know where I was. I can remember the exact day that I first decided to try some of this cannabis stuff. And what, what, the, what the government was telling me at that time about it, what my parents were telling me, what the church was telling me, what the doctors were telling me, all of the information from the people that should know better was that cannabis is gonna destroy your brain. <laughs> You'll be a blithering fool. You won't be able to hold a job, rent a house, have children. If you do, they'll be morons. That's what we were told back then, you know. I had four morons on, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> and one of I got a couple going on myself. They're pretty well accomplished one, morons. One of my morons is a black belt in Taekwondo. <laughs> yeah. She's still just a kid. And she's only a kid, yeah. and, and I'm the best example of all of it, I think, you know. Or am I a blithering fool? Maybe I'm just a blithering fool. Maybe the people at Pot TV were willing to give up the platform For to a blithering, blithering fool a to get now. up here and, and, and try to make sense of nothing and try to tell you a bunch of stuff that ain't true. No. <laughs> I'm here because I can articulate properly. I can speak to these issues. <coughs> My memory is intact. My abilities have not diminished, they've increased. For now. For now. <laughs> Maybe it only kicks in after you're 80. Mm -hmm. Oh no, there's Willie Nelson and Tommy Chong yeah, yeah. and all these other, Paul McCartney yeah, yeah, and all yeah. these other people Look at all those other that people. are in their 80s now. Yeah, and smoking that have been, cannabis. And they probably smoked more than me. Probably. Certainly Willie did and Tommy did. Probably better stuff. Which and really better would stuff be, even. We, which we would think would be harder to get right now. But yeah, yeah they probably got some real good stuff. People that we have. Paul and Willie and Tom had better <laughs> weed than us. And lots more of it. And they consumed a lot more of it than we have. And that's going some because, you know, I've been a consumer for all these years. I've never stopped. I've never had to stop. So, you know. I like to smoke a drug with Snoop Dogg. I guess you don't hear the government coming out anymore and talking about how it's going to destroy your mind. Right? Yeah. What are they saying now? <laughs> the only thing they got 
is that it's going to harm the developing brain. Yeah. That you have to wait until you're at least, what, 19? 16. I, 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 the, yeah. the, the, the legal access to the stores is at 19. Oh. You know? Oh. But you, so, if so you're what? an adult and you want to give your child alcohol, that's okay. But if you're an adult and you want to give your child cannabis, you could be going to jail. jail right? Right? You could lose your kids. Oh, holy fuck, eh? Okay, poison your kids, but don't do and, and, and let's, government, let's just realistically have a little comparison between <laughs> alcohol and tobacco in our society. <laughs> Are they really that <laughs> stupid? No, they're that corrupt. Yeah. This is how corrupt they are. I'm, I'm beside myself. I can't even believe it. That here we are almost six years into a program that within the first six months, we had demonstrated successfully that what we're doing is safe. Yep. No one was harmed in the first six months. Nobody's been harmed in the next five years after that. Nobody's and people been have been helped in profound ways. And if the government would believe these people and listen to these people, they would hear stories like we hear every day yeah. about how cannabis turned their life around, gave them, gave them back that health and well-being that they had, they had not had before because they were either addicted to alcohol or hard drugs all of these things we hear every day. I'm sure the government hears it too. And even Monday morning after the RV had been burned, you had a lineup of people waiting Long for you to put the tent up. And I was just looking at that lineup. It's like, it's Monday. And, and most of them had heard about the fire already, and but yet they were still there and saying, what would we do if you were not here? Yes. Right? They were so worried. And there, some people were happy to see that he was still there and that the tent was back. And the comments we here. get yeah. you know, are exactly along those lines. Yeah. Thank you so much for still being here. Yeah. I was horrified that you wouldn't be. Yeah. Um, you know what? You know what am I? What are we going to do without you? Are we going to go back and use the other drugs again? Because yeah. I don't know where we're going to get high dose edibles like you guys have. It was a long night of that Monday morning, uh, this Monday morning. So I was very, like, very surprised to see. But they were all, I think, maybe coming to see if you were still here too. So, and to offer their support, yep. their condolences, their condolences, uh, whatever they can do to help. So many people have stepped forward to say, "What can we do to help?" There's not a lot people can do to help except contact government. Yeah, only wholesale. support support what we're doing here. Yeah, only um, wholesale sent you an ounce of shatter to help out. So that's in the mail coming to me. So I'll bring to you. Yeah. Um, um, I, I mentioned the medicinal cannabis dispensary. Yeah, uh, some people love uh, Erica. Uh, by the way, Erica's got these. Uh, cannabis. I thought I had that uh, in view there. I'm not sure. Yeah. It's still well, it's not now because well, I've moved in here. Oh, because you moved in. You changed the, the camera. Desk. Bring it on. All right. The desk. I just. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, that thing. Oh, oh, I opened up the 24th. Oh, oh wow. Wow. Uh, but I didn't consume it. If you put it right in front of you, I'm thinking it'll just be fine. Okay. That's, that's it right there. There you go. Yeah. You can you can get these. From uh, ediblecalendar.com, uh, ediblecalendar.com, yeah. uh, there's a lot in here. There's like 6,000 milligrams of edibles in here and a bunch of flour. And there's different levels of these calendars. There's ones yeah. that are quite a bit cheaper that just have flour, uh, and there's everything in between. 75 to $350, I see. they range from, yep. Or wasn't it? Isn't it five hundred for the for the real super nope, deluxe one? The, the number four was three hundred and fifty dollars. Yes. Right. Yeah. You can go check it out yourself if you don't yeah. believe Glenn or I, because we don't really agree or know, but uh, he knows probably. Ediblecalendar.com. I only think I know. <laughs> Ediblecalendar.com. Yeah. Check it out. And speaking of Erica, um, Miss Medibles, a great activist, uh, a very brave young lady. Um, tasked with uh, trying to raise a disabled child that's, uh, that's such a hard job for her. We can, none of us can really imagine what, what, what the struggles are for her and her little family there. But uh, she soldiers on for the cause mm -hmm. and she's been setting up tents and doing events at Thornton Park for a while and on Saturday past VPD shows up uh, seizes a bunch of product, uh, tries to chase those people away, arrested one person and took his whole tent away. Yeah. Uh, this is a harm reduction outlet on the edge of the downtown east side. Yeah. What is the government doing wasting our money trying to stop harm reduction initiatives when harm initiatives are going on all up and down the street here? They're not hard to find. They're, they're on... <laughs> You should see what Hastings Street looks like now, thanks yeah. to the drug war yeah. and, and government policy that, that, that drives poverty There's and drug no addiction and homelessness. There's no downtown that looks like Hastings 
Oh, I've seen I've seen pictures in Oregon. No, I'm in uh, Canada. In Canada, I in think Canada, Canada. That's the worst yeah. in Canada. In, in Canada, we have going on here because oh, yeah. you can't do this in Toronto. No, you, you oh, can't oh, do it Winnipeg, in Montreal or Winnipeg. Regina, it is yeah. too bloody cold. Yeah. You cannot do that there. Yeah. So homeless people, poor people, sick people, addicted people, they end up here. Mm -hmm. In the downtown east side, there's all these services. There's estimates from a bill from a million dollars a day to four or five million dollars a day that's pouring in here. Yeah, I think provincial 14, government just said there was fourteen billion. No, 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 five billion dollars a year a has been st spent yeah. here. Yeah, which which, uh, is which you know the math on that a, a day for those people smarter yeah. than me is a lot. No, I'm just recording that. It's five billion. It's okay, you can be 14, smarter than me. Okay, okay. Yeah. all right. I don't know. I'm younger. <laughs> I think older people are smarter because they've had more life experience. Oh, not all old people are smart. Okay. I said smarter. I didn't say smart. Oh, I no, no, <laughs> there, you, there you go. Yeah. Um, actually, you know, I'm, I'm very impressed with a lot of young people these days who are definitely smarter than yeah, me. Yeah, well, good. You know? They got the internet. We had fucking encyclopedias. That's right. If we wanted to look up that stuff, we had to go through pages and pages of stuff that would, might not even make sense, right? I spent the first 50 <laughs> years of my life being wrong about a ton of stuff that I had no idea about. <laughs> Yeah. These days, if you're in a circle of people, even if there's like a six-year-old kid there and somebody says something and, and, and they're not sure if that's true or not, within seconds, the six-year-old kid has gone, oh, no, 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 this is, yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. Yeah. Well, so, I do that too now. I, oh, I me too. All my facts are well, everybody right hopefully now. is doing that now. Well, Let's yeah. not be wrong about things for long yeah. periods of time like yeah. we used to be, eh? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's, a, it's an amazing world here. But the government is stupid as hell. They're, they're a bunch of dinosaurs who don't have a clue, who are simply being paid by the, the financial parasites to take advantage of us and to allow us to be taken advantage of. This is what our government is doing. That's, that's the only thing they do. They, they, they simply take advantage of the situations on behalf of their corporate elite. That's what they do. They're not here to serve our needs. They're here to serve the needs of their masters, who are not us. And this has been very well demonstrated in many different ways in, in the last little bit here. So we're doing that. And that's what I said when we started the program, was we're going to do one of two things. We are going to expose just how corrupt the government is, or we are going to succeed in getting low barrier access in a storefront that is dignified for people. So far, Almost six years now, the only thing we've been able to do is expose the corruption of the government. That, it, that the corruption goes right to the top. This is in the, in the PMO's office. This is in the Justice Minister's office. Don't tell me they don't know the truth. Mm, don't tell me they don't know that there is no reason and never was any reason that justifies using the criminal law against free people who simply want to access a herb for their own health and well-being. There was never, ever any justification for that. And don't you try and tell me that the Justice Minister and the PMO did not understand that for many, many decades. I know that they did. But if they didn't, then my goodness, are they ever derelict in their duties, eh? Because those are two departments that really need to know. Because they're the ones who are continuing to waste millions and over this last hundred years in Canada of the attempt to prohibit cannabis, billions of our precious tax dollars on ruining people's lives. Like it's one thing if they're using billions of dollars and it's just being wasted, it's just down the toilet, mm -hmm. you know, it's just going into the pockets of the, the financial parasites of this world. That's one thing. But when you're taking all that money, our money, not theirs, our money, money that I worked damn hard for, that I had to give to the government every payday and every time I bought anything, money's going to the government that they're using against me and against my family and my friends. They used those billions of dollars to ruin Canadian lives. Over 50,000 Canadians charged with simple possession of cannabis. A serious criminal record follows a conviction of possession of cannabis. 
a record that will keep you from traveling, that will hinder your job searching, that will probably alienate you from your family and your neighborhood and your community. They have been ruining lives with our money for almost a hundred years. In January, it'll be a hundred years since Minister Belland, a liberal backbencher, stood up in the Canadian legislature and said, we have a new drug in the schedule, and sat back down. With no conversation, no debate, nothing. They simply wrote it down in the book that now along with the Chinese smoked version of opium and cocaine, the cannabis plant is now illegal. Free Canadian people not allowed to use a plant. Free Canadian people who supposedly value their freedom to the point where we sent people off to die to protect it. And what is the symbol of that sacrifice of our forefathers? The symbol is a poppy. Mm -hmm. A poppy. The source of heroin and, and opium and, 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 and that amazing drug that helps people so much when they're in pain but can also be a scourge if they get to the point where they can't get off it without going through withdrawal. It's never meant... Mother Nature never meant opioids to be a long-term solution for human beings. It's there when you need it. When you're having a limb amputated or some serious pain going on for a short time. It's an extremely valuable painkiller. But not one that you want to get addicted to. And yet the pharmaceutical companies live off of addiction. That's their biggest profit. Mm -hmm. Is that people are addicted to their substances. They have to use them all the time. They can't get off them. And we have governments that support these people. We have a medical profession in Canada that is based on pharmaceutical medicine. Those synthetics that they managed to glean from the actual chemistry of Mother Nature's plants, the opium plant, the cannabis plant, and other plants that have medicinal value. The pharmaceutical parasites figure out how to make synthetic versions of those and then patent them and then charge through the the roof for them. Once again, many people have been ruined by pharmaceuticals. Many people have been ruined by the cost of pharmaceuticals where they have to choose between their medicine and their food or their housing. The worst part is though is the addictive nature of the opioids and how they preyed on that. How they came up with Oxycontin. That they then prescribed for everything. So many millions of people in North America addicted to opioids because of overprescribing by doctors who never should have prescribed those things in the first place. The go-to for medicine should have been cannabis-based, like it was back in the late 1800s, until, until the Rockefellers got into a partnership with the Bayer Pharmaceutical Company in Germany and started funding schools and funding university health programs so that they could be the ones with the answer to people's medical problems. And the answer was their synthetic pharmaceuticals, mostly opioids. They love the addictive nature, addictive nature of those products. It keeps people coming back. It's like the sugar industry. They put that shit in everything. Why? Because it's addictive. Mm -hmm. We have been preyed upon by parasites who are using our, our ill health to exploit us to take away our money, and then to stigmatize us, and now to call us drug users, and to deny us services and quality of care. All corrupt as can be. The cannabis consumers are the smart ones in this world. This is the smart choice. Everything, almost, that you could go to a doctor for, that doctor should be prescribing cannabis in some form to deal with that. Because cannabis is a mimic to our own internal immune system, that endocannabinoid system that they discovered when they tried to prove that cannabis has no medicinal value. Turns out, it's the exact chemistry required to work in our own human bodies 
that our immune system uses to deal with all the things that can go wrong. The go-to for medical people should be cannabis-based. It's the first one that should be tried. Maybe it's not the best one, but it's the first one that should be tried. Why? Because it has so few side effects. There is no real problem with trying cannabis as a topical, as an edible, as a concentrate, just consuming the vapors from the flower, as a suppository. Many different ways you can apply cannabis, and that should be the go-to. Because it doesn't have serious side effects at all. It's going to make you a little bit hungry, maybe. It's going to make you a little bit sleepy, maybe. It's going to make you laugh when otherwise you wouldn't have thought it was funny, maybe. It's going to put you in a better mood, for sure, but all these side effects are not bad side effects. Being sleepy when you're not well is exactly what you should be doing. You should be letting your body recover. So a substance that you use that provides you with the, the supplement to your endocannabinoid system and makes you sleepy at the same time, that's a marvelous medicine. Or maybe it's the euphoria. Maybe it's not the CBN and the CBG. Maybe it's the THC that is the best part of that medicine. All of those cannabinoids, and there's over a hundred of them present in the cannabis plant, all of them have medicinal value of different properties for different things. A THC might be the best one. THC provides euphoria. If you're not well, the best medicine is something that's going to make you feel better. Mm -hmm. Something that's going to put a smile on your face. Something that's going to make you laugh at something you might not have otherwise found funny. Or even just forget that you're sick. Because you know what they say, right? Yeah. Medicine, or pardon me, laughter yeah, is the, the best, best medicine. medicine. Yeah. Yes. The indigenous people of this continent of ours has had a saying about what medicine was when they were asked what they thought medicine was. Anything good. Anything good. If it's good and you think about it, and you're thinking about something good, yeah. you're not thinking about being sick. Yeah. You're not feeding into that loop of your subconscious believing that you're sick and then making you sick because you believe that you're sick. Yeah. It takes you out of that loop. Yeah. It puts you into a thing where, oh, oh, well that's good. Well, that's, I like that. <laughs> and pretty soon you feel good. Yeah. Laughter is the best medicine and THC is the best vehicle to get there. Yeah. And that's what Mother Nature has done for us. This is a profoundly good medicine. Despite all the lies you've heard and all your suspended belief about whether or not dope could be good for people. This is real medicine. Mm -hmm. This is what Mother Nature provided for us to deal with all the things. And, 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 and maybe there's no Mother Nature that provided. But there kind of is because nature is our mother. Mm -hmm. And nature has caused all of this because we are life that has evolved here, that has just sprung here. None of us asked to be here. We were just spit out and we're alive. And here we are. And what are we? We're a cat. No, I'm a dolphin. No, I'm a human. <laughs> You're an angel. <laughs> we were just spit out here as life. And that's been going on for millennia. For maybe a billion years or three billion years or more. For the first billion years, apparently, we were just microbes. Single little units of life that managed to figure out how to combine their resources and turn into multicellular organisms and then complex multicellular organisms and then intelligent complex multicellular organisms and all of it was just life living and if you're going to live to live you must consume yeah and whatever it is that you consume that is what you are going to be you are what you eat they say, they say. <laughs> i believe you are what you, i believe you are what your ancestors ate <laughs> that's what you really are you are what your ancestors ate and that ancestry goes way, way back. Yeah. We all have common ancestors with rodents and chimpanzees, or you know, primates and, primates, and yeah. fish, and all these things. We all have an unbroken chain of procreation that goes right back to the beginning of life on this planet. So life has been on this planet, consuming to live and becoming what it consumes. 
You become what it is that you're consuming. You are made of what you are consuming. And our ancestors, millennia ago, were consuming cannabis mm -hmm. more than anything else. Yep. It was the main staple food source of human beings, but way and before we were human beings. Making medicine with it too. Way before we were human beings. This plant was prolific on this planet yeah. and was being consumed by the organisms on this planet. And how do I know this? Because all of the vertebrates on the planet share our endocannabinoid system. We all have a system within our beings, all the vertebrates, and some non-vertebrates have a system within their being that is based on cannabinoids. How can that be? You are what you eat. Our ancestors ate cannabis. We became cannabis-based beings. And this plant, they've tried to prohibit from us. Not because it ever did any damage, but you wouldn't know that if you followed back into history and saw what they were saying about it back at the turn of the century when they were trying to put down the colored people, when they were trying to protect Rockefeller's rights, when they were trying to do all these other corrupt things. You would think this was the devil's weed. <laughs> That's what they even called it. I've been waiting for my horns to grow. My grandmother <laughs> went to her grave at 102 years of age, having told me in her last year of life, God didn't make marijuana. The devil did. Wow. <laughs> they lied, and if you're going to lie, my tell a big you. lie. Tell a big one. Yeah. If you want to succeed in lying, make it a very big lie. Takes years and that's what they did. Yeah. <laughs> and they lied and they lied and they lied. And they did it to a vulnerable population of people who were not very sophisticated in their thinking. They did it through media, which permeated throughout society, where they told these lies repeatedly over and over again. William Randolph Hearst is the biggest offender, but there were many others. But William Randolph Hearst had a bone to pick with the Mexicans. Mm -hmm. So he, and not only that, there was much more than that. It wasn't just that he didn't like the Mexicans taking a whole bunch of what he thought was his land when they reclaimed their border. It was much more that the cannabis-based paper that he was using for his newspapers, he could replace cheaper with wood waste paper in a partnership with the Dow Chemical Company. So William Randolph Hearst went on a campaign to demonize cannabis so that he could use his wood waste paper and sell his wood waste paper across North America. That was the big financial incentive. It's funny when you really look at the motives behind those people, you, you see that there's some self-righteousness, there's some religious beliefs, that, but no, most of that was all just convenient and, and used because they could use it to hide some much larger financial motivation. Most of this is all about money. It's always been all about money. And for the love of money, which we were warned about in the Bible as being the root of all evil, the love of money is why we're here where we are today after almost a hundred years of wasting tax dollars, ruining people's lives, and lying about the most important plant in human life. Oh, man. <laughs> I know. Eh? Hey, I get going and I get going. I know. But, uh, That's all right. I'm the live one. <laughs> I'll give you a rest. I'll give you a future for possibilities. John West is in the studio. That's what you're hearing there. Yeah, yeah. Not a scheduled <laughs> guest. But, uh, in uh, any case, uh, why don't we lighten it up and talk about tubes and tubes? Yeah, we got that to do. We got a list of things to yeah. do today. Yeah, I'm okay. going to leave then because I am here as a volunteer to assist this cause, and I've always been that. I do my funny hair because I'm a clown and I'm a fool, and I also followed you for some considerable time, and I recognize you as an earth angel, which you can laugh at if you will. But there no, are laughing. Thank you, John. I say thank, thank you, John. I'm just saying we're in the middle of a show, and I, you know, we can have no, this conversation no. at some other time, perhaps. But well, uh, per perhaps some other time. Perhaps this is a better time because we've come we're, to we've come to the end of this story many times. Most of the people who are 
lifts, but we have to show them how we can move this government. And I am, John, and, and, I, and I've, got a, I've, got a long, I've got a long how, list of how, things how. to talk about, and uh, I'm not willing to, to revisit this conversation with you at this time. Uh, you well, know, let we, me just we can say maybe this. do it I on another one show. I have to say to the marijuana community, please do not vote for any party politicians. Demand We've none of the above on the ballot before you enter. Tell the government that. And you've said that numerous times on the show. I'm sure yeah. most of my, my, well, my yeah, people get that audience, idea. Uh, they need to get that idea, and you <coughs> need to do it. Well, like I said, I'm not willing okay? to visit. I'm not willing to visit that on the show I today. I know you are because and, you're uh, not the man. I right. happen to be the man right now because there's four just men. John, we'll have you in back. In Canada, we'll have you back. Just, no, well, then kindly invite me John, because you've yeah. never gone out of your way to invite me. Because I speak the truth, John, I've and you know that I speak the truth. I've seen you here yeah, on the show. I times. don't care to be seen. I'm yeah. quite happy to be a voice sitting in the bloody cupboard. You've been on the show probably more than most other people. Maybe two, Landlord has been on there more than you. Two times. No, and, and John, on your, your, week your after memory week is going. Week. You've been on the and show. This gentleman, who I respect, is on here all the time. He's and my head. He's my. This show. So it becomes. I've watched it three times. I think it's the same show. It's the same show. Uh, with a little bit of news. And where's the, where's the energy of this movement? I'm saying right now, this movement is a real bunch of people. And you're a leader in this movement. But you must be able to look towards the future and not constantly remind us what everybody knows. Then allow me to lead. And right now, I'm in the middle of a show. I've got a lot of things I'm to cover. I'm very rude. And, uh, I'm and very, please allow I'm me to do that. If I'm being rude, well, Canada can judge that. All right. But you All don't right. have to see my face anymore. Thank you. But this is what cooperation is. Boy, oh boy. I've been, I was out there at the John, Supreme I'm Court. John, I'm, I'm in the middle of the show. the show. Can you please not you have this no not, in If you. you want to take me to task on something, please do it other no, than when I'm, I'm angry. I'm made angry because I'm an angel trying to serve the Lord and you treat us like we're idiots. Well, we're not idiots. No, I don't, John. Well, and you in do fact, because you don't respect us. John, you just I've been the sitting here time. listening to your whole show and you don't respect me. Do you me. remember your last conversation with me on the phone, sir? On the way? You called me up and had some really nasty things to say to me on the phone. I did. I yes, said you, you showed did. no respect so, to your you know, counters. So ignore me. Twenty years so older please than ignore you, me. And I know a lot more about what went down before you got here. So disrespect the elders. I, I'm a nobody. I've always given you respect, but it's difficult to respect you when you come into my studio and interrupt my show and oh, want to have, wanna have these, this that's type of call, a conversation. That's what here. they call gaslighting. Yes, make me the idiot. Make me the fool, by all means. I've always been a fool to people that have, what should we say, not much expansion in their brains. No disrespect, but you guys got work. And you need to do the future properly and talk to me respectfully. Thank you. Wow. How old is he? He's 20 years older than me. Wow. Yes. And he certainly did not speak to me respectfully the last time he had me no. on here. No. And, uh, you know, as much as I uh, have appreciated John's work over the last uh, 20 years or more that I've been involved here, he's on a campaign to get people to vote no. Yeah. And I've given him more than enough opportunity to explain that particular position. And he's never been able to do it in a way that has satisfied me that that is a strategy that would work. Um, if everybody voted no or didn't vote at all, then perhaps we would have to get put in a caretaker government and there would be different rules in play and we wouldn't get the same people that are just nothing more than servants to the corporate elite that are there now. But in my opinion, if a whole bunch of people just don't vote because they want what John wants and what we all probably want in a, in a better government, then we will get a lot worse government because some people will be voting for those people that have enough money to convince people to vote whose interest it is to vote in that and I just don't believe that that's a strategy that would work unless it was properly organized and orchestrated and without millions and millions of dollars and a huge campaign to be able to explain to Canadians why right. that might be a solution to this corruption that we're dealing with yeah. I don't see it succeeding at all in fact I see it going the other way yeah. but I have given John more than enough time to express those views on the program over the years that we've been doing it uh, I must say, I do not appreciate him just showing up and deciding that he's going to come on and talk to us again about it when I've already got my show and my agenda planned and all the rest of it. I'm very sorry that uh, there was that uh, disruption in today's show. 
Uh, this is a live show, and that's what happens sometimes when you do that. So the week was disruptions. Oh, oh wow. man, have we ever had some disruptions? <laughs> wow. And, uh, you know, what we were talking about was the corruption in the government, the amount of money that's being wasted, the, 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 the lack of reason behind any of these laws that they've been enforcing on us, and now we have legalization. Yep. Yeah. Which is a lie. Which is more lies, yeah. more corruption, absolutely. And thankfully, there's going to be a bit of a forum held on that. Uh, yeah. You can go to rabble.ca coming up on November 17th, and there's going to be a debate, um, a discussion about who it is that's left out of legalization. And obviously, we're here to tell you that the addicted are being left out, the, the sick are being left out, the poor people are being left out for sure. So uh, Jody Emery, uh, Don Davies, uh, Libby Davies, uh, they are going to be uh, some of the cast of, of people that are going to discuss these things. And uh, please tune into that and please uh, take part in this. The, these are very serious times that we are living in right now. Uh, there's a number of different uh, things at play and we need to be on our game as well. That if we were to allow for what they've proposed as legalization to be entrenched in our society here and we all settle for that, then the poor, the sick, and the addicted are out of that picture, struggling on, dying in vast numbers, suffering, and all the rest that happens with that. We are in very crucial times right now. We need to win this thing that we've oh, yeah. been fighting for so long. We have come a long way. There is no question about that. Just in Canada alone, to be able to have these abilities to speak compared to what it's like in some other countries. Mm -hmm. And we're losing that as well as time goes on here, our ability to speak. You can't even mention certain topics without being banned and barred and, and, and cancelled yeah. in our society. It's getting worse, not better. These are very serious times. We need to be addressing these issues of freedom. At the very core, we're talking about freedom here. We're discussing this one plant and its value and how there's no justification for trying to prohibit it and all the damage that that does. But at the very root of all of it, it's really about what freedom is supposed to be, what the role of government is supposed to be in a free country. This is what's important right now in our history, in our time. These are historic times that we are living in. We all need to be on our game. Every one of us. There's no, no time for just passengers on this, this journey through space that we're on right now. We need crew members. We need everybody to feel like this is their journey, that this is their task, that we all need to try to leave this planet better than we found it. Yeah. And this is an area of most importance. Of all the different areas, that's why I focus on this one. There are many areas where we're not free. I could have a, a show for sure. I'm thankful that many other smart journalists are out there talking about the lack of freedoms that we're, we're, we're being handed right now and, all, and how it's being taken away and how all these social media platforms are censoring people and, and banning people and all the rest of it. And that they're part of a, a larger political agenda of controlling us and exploiting us. We need people talking about that. My mission that's been handed to me because of the journey that I ventured on and just doing what's right as I go has led me to this one. That the attempt to prohibit cannabis for the last hundred years is the biggest scourge on our society that we could have had and it is the most glaring example of how we are not free. We are not the masters of our own fate. And that we better wrestle that back from those people who have stolen it from us pretty soon. Or maybe we won't have that ability. Because we are living in a technological age where if the powers that be get those powers to act out that agenda, then we'll find ourselves under surveillance to the point where we dare not speak up about anything. They will continue to use huge hammers to deal with small problems yeah. so that the, the whole problems go away. We need to be part of the solution, all of us. We need to find our niche. We need to see that which it is that we are passionate about. Thankfully, there's people passionate about numerous different sides to this fight for freedom, and many of them are speaking out. We all need to be on that journey together. Listen to Russell Brand, for example. A voice out there gathering more and more voices, trying to talk truth trying to expose what's going on, trying to let us all understand that we're owned by a huge, huge conglomerate of financial parasites who control the media, the energy, all of it, everything. 
And we need to wrestle our freedom back. And not for us. Not for us. For your daughter. Mm -hmm. For my son. For the, the children that haven't been born yet. Yeah. Are we going to have a prison planet of technological superior parasites who are exploiting the mul multitudes and the masses of people who are then just going to work and consume for them for the far future because that's what can happen if we don't get on it. It's almost like slavery without the chains. It really is in, right. in many yeah. ways. Not well, to diminish mean, what it was to be a slave, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But uh, in a sense, they are running it, they're making all the money, and we're doing all the work, right? Slavery <laughs> was one of the go-tos for these financial parasites for yeah. quite a while. Yeah. Um, like because it could work for them. Yeah. Um, it was a different time back then. But it wasn't easy still. No. You know, the slavery the side suffering. of things was difficult for those people that had slaves. Yeah. Um, they kept trying to run away. Yeah. You had to feed them. Oh, wow. They needed sleep before they could work. Uh, they, really, weren't, they weren't happy doing what they were doing for you. You know, they could rebel at any time. Uh, there was all these different problems that they had with slavery. So they found different ways of exploiting the multitudes of people. And, and here we are, fined to death, taxed to death, pushed by corporations into choices that aren't best for us but are best for them. All of these things that are happening in our world are the financial parasites just preying on us. And we live in a, most people are living in an illusion of it all. They don't really understand. It doesn't matter to them really. Um, you know, that because there's a football game coming up on Sunday that they don't want to miss or, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We have been overwhelmed, uh, entertained, distracted, angered, made drunk and stupid. And all of these things is all part of the agenda of the financial parasites who want to prey on us. And the media is owned by them. So you can't count on the media to tell you the truth. Thankfully, this media that I am right now is not owned by anybody but me. And these are my opinions. And thank you for watching. And your truth. You know, these are the things that I think are true and important. And I'm not affected by any of those people. And maybe if enough of you people watch, Maybe then I will be. <laughs> I mean, Russell Brand, if he gets big enough, they got to do something about him, right? Yeah, yeah. They'll find a way to buy him off or they'll have to get rid of him. Huh. Who knows? But that is the case. That's always been the case. And that cannot deter us from the fight for freedom. No. We just went through Remembrance Day. Yeah. That should be a very heavy day for all of us. It should be a day when we think about what it must have been like for those young men and women that had signed up to go and defend our country and their families. I didn't even know what it was like, but I still shed a tear during those times when we were watching it. I was watching it in Ottawa. I have no right? idea, but I, right, but I, I try I, to imagine my it. My family was in it, right? So I had family too. Like, my great great uncle, uncle, right? My grandmother, my mother, my father. Right, yeah. and they must have lost a lot of friends and stuff like that. So oh, they lost you know, their lives. Uh, yeah, they lost yeah. their lives. They're still alive. Yeah, <laughs> but they're still traumatized by the war that they had to take part in. It yeah. totally reshaped their life mm -hmm. into you know into horrors for the most part. PTSD is so real amongst veterans, and maybe maybe it's not all veterans because all veterans don't want to admit that they got it going on. But I'll tell you, if you're a human being and you are in that situation where you feel you need to go and put your life in front of bullets and bombs to protect your family and your country. I mean, I can't imagine either what that must have been like. I can only assume that that must have been extremely profound in their lives and had a huge impact on them as people. And for those that actually did go over and get into trenches and take bullets and take, you know, and get their limbs blown off and all the rest of the things that happened. Or, or, or maybe they came out intact, but they watched their friends get blown away. Or, you know, you can't go to war without losing your life. No. You can't. Yeah. You are not the same person yeah. after you come back from something like that. Yeah. You are not the, the happy, thriving, you know, vibrant human being that you, that you would have been you if you hadn't that. been put through that, right? Yeah. So we really need to respect those people that did that. They did it for us. Like I said, they, that wasn't for them that they were going to take those bullets. They didn't even expect to come home alive. 
They did it for their kids. Yeah. And the kids and the grandkids that they would never even meet. <coughs> Our future. Our, the future of humanity. Yeah. We need to respect that. Yeah. All of us need to respect what those people did. Now, sure, you can say, and it's probably true, that they were just going to fight a war for the financial parasites who were after the other country's oil or whatever else it was. And yes, probably that was at the root of these wars and, and at a much higher level than the average person going to get shot. And we were buying stuff to make guns and, and weapons with, so that was a machine, right? And that those people were getting rich because war, you know, to make war makes people rich. Clothing, right? Some people get rich on war and that's why there's war. Because some people are getting rich. So we need to respect that the sacrifice that was made by the common man to go and fight what they saw as a threat to their families and their country. Whether that was the real truth of it or not, it doesn't matter. Our forefathers fought for our freedom, mm -hmm. and we need to respect that. And how do we respect that? We don't put up with bullies. We call out our governments when they're acting on behalf of the financial parasites. We do things. We figure out what we can do, each and every one of us. Whatever aspect of this fight for freedom that you're passionate about, we need you. We need you to think about what you can do. Don't risk your family, maybe. I don't know. If you've got a family, you need to put your family first. But you also need to think about the family's future with respect to freedom and the role of government and how things are going here. <coughs> And one of the things you need to do if you're running a family is look after their future by not allowing governments to become entrenched in those freedom-stripping policies that they've been involved in on behalf of the financial parasites for all of this time. We need to respect their efforts by putting forth our efforts to do what we can do to try to gain the freedom that we don't have, that we need to have, that our future generations are going to be devastated if we don't get. Man, I'm really going on about it today, but uh, you know, these are serious times here. They are. Tune in to uh, Off the Hill on November 17th through rabble.ca and uh, take part in that to make your, put your comments down there, <coughs> write letters, make phone calls, send emails, talk to people, and there's a whole bunch of other things. I always just throw those things out there. Those are the easy ones. Those are the ones anybody can do. But I bet you everybody out there has got some quirky little way that they think that maybe they could make a difference, you know. And you should go and do that. You should try to spend some of your time respecting the efforts of our forefathers to gain us the freedom that we still don't have. And not let it all be for waste. Because I didn't fight the cannabis laws to have the flippin' prohibitionists take over the industry, call it legalization, continue to persecute and prosecute anybody that's not part of their cartel, and keep the prices up there out of reach for the poor and the sick. This is not what I've been fighting for, and I'm not about to let it end that way. And this society of ours is not what our veterans and our forefathers were fighting for in the name of freedom. And we need to continue doing something about that. So, what else is on our agenda? Tubes and dubes. Tubes and dubes. John Murray is in the house with muffins and cookies and a yeah. smile and a wave. Yeah. Hi, buddy! <laughs> Hi, John. Wait, wait, another John. <laughs> He's, John. John is fighting the fight. Yes. He's not putting on a flak jacket, taking a gun, and going into bombs and bullets. Don't have to do that. He's baking muffins and cookies for the addicted with wow. cannabis in them because that's what works and that's what's also going to continue to pave the way for low barrier access. Mm -hmm. It's continuing to have people willing to spend their time making muffins and cookies and edibles for people where we can give them away or make them available and allow that to prove and demonstrate that these things are safe you shouldn't eat too much. That's not no, every fun. No, not too many. Won't kill you. Especially John's. Won't hurt you. <laughs> Won't kill you in any significant or hurt you in any significant way. Won't kill you. Thank you, cookies. But it can be uncomfortable. Don't eat 
four of these if you've never eaten cannabis edibles yeah. and expect yeah. that it's going to be good for you and be nice. These are 100 milligrams each, 400 milligrams. Most people are going to be, you know, flat on their back or hanging on to a pole and <laughs> wishing it was over for two days. <laughs> if you just started. Yeah, if you yeah. haven't done it before. I, I could do that. So there's the big this. warning about yeah. the big dangers of cannabis is, is if you take the extracts and you bake it into edibles, you better be careful how much you eat at one time because it can be very uncomfortable. Won't kill you, no long-term health effects, but you're not going to like it very much. But if you know, about and you might it, not ever do it again. That's yeah. the bit. That's if, the worst. If thing. you know to experience <coughs> it, then cannabis is a much, edibles are a much better uh, a, a trip adventure or whatever. Absolutely, yeah. you just started a low just dose start and you low. move up from there slowly. You'll never have a bad experience if you start low. <coughs> low. Exactly. Right? And then you're you tolerate you, you'll build up. Well, you'll find your limit, right? Yeah, and then you'll be able to do it. You'll yeah. find your limit because you will get to a point where this is a little bit uncomfortable. And next time, I'm not doing quite that much. It won't be that full-blown uncomfortable experience that you get when you really overdose on cannabis edibles that's what you need to do everybody needs if they have health issues right or, if you don't want health issues who cares <laughs> or, or but if you got health issues you're trying to get off of opioids or whatever <coughs> you need to find your limit <coughs> and every human being needs to do that what's on my water okay you want it here you, you got a bottle here whatever I'll I like other people's germs, by the way. People are going to hate me go. for that, but uh, ah, see, I'm not into sir. I'm not into viruses so much. <laughs> but I do like other people's germs. I think, <laughs> I think they make me stronger. Another example of eating too much is like, oh, I really wanted to watch that movie, but I ate too much edibles. Right? It doesn't oh, have to be discomfort. It could do yeah. just like wow. You know how many people have missed events <laughs> because of edibles? Yeah, exactly. How many people have gone to the bar and drank too much? Mm. Well, true. Of course, you can. Yeah. But then get in the car and drive away. We're not. Saying that you this is much unique to cannabis. <laughs> We're just saying that the journey to understand whether edibles can help you or not usually involves having to do a little bit too much at some point yeah. so that you know where your upper limits are. It's an yeah. important thing to do. And it's not something the government can tell you. They can't say, well, no. this is the limit for everybody because it really isn't at all. Some people have no limit. I've met people who cannot eat too much edibles. They've mm -hmm. tried repeatedly can't do it. Hmm. I met other people, they can't get me on five milligrams. No. Five milligrams. But that's that that's where they're comfortable. The judge and people in that. wheelchairs, only a couple of them. Most people in wheelchairs, they need hundreds and yep. thousands of, of milligrams and that's what helps them. Yep. But I know a couple of people through our lineup at Van Du that all they could take and wanted to take where their limit was was five milligrams about every half an hour. Yeah. They'd pop another five milligram gummy, that's you know, it. and that's it. Or have a little bite of a cookie or a muffin. And, and they're good with that. So the government can't tell you what the limit is, and that was struck down in the in the in the uh, Warnicky, Seaman, and Martin case. Yeah. The, yeah. It's it's unconstitutional for a government to put caps on potency. Yeah. And for that reason, you don't know what your what your cap is or where your yeah. limit is until you go there and find out. They don't tell you that you can only drink one shot of whiskey out of that bottle. Right? Yeah, exactly. They, <laughs> right? they have recommend they have recommendations. Yeah, yeah. But they don't put caps on. <laughs> they don't say you can only buy this much alcohol. Yeah, you can only have ten percent of right. what it'll get you health there or whatever it is, the effect. Man, it's, right? Christmas yeah. is coming up. <laughs> you, know, you know what I see a lot at Christmas time as I'm driving by liquor stores? Uh. Is people with shopping carts full of boxes full of hard liquor loading it into their trunk. <laughs> I see that a lot. I wonder if you'll see that at the cannabis store, people walking around with big loads, bag, brown pie, big paper bags. <laughs> and then, and then there's that other competitor to weed. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you shouldn't stores. be smoking this stuff. It's dangerous, apparently. Oh, really? Because a lot of the world are smoking something else that's definitely proven to be dangerous. Yeah. And uh, you can still buy that in stores. In fact, you can buy that in vending machines and gas stations and, you know, all over the place. Like, you can what, buy. 16 bucks a pack now? Though? I don't know. I don't <laughs> smoke. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, about that. Is 16 that right, bucks yeah. a pack. Okay. When well, I was buying it for my mom or, and, and dad or stepdad, it was like two bucks a pack. I think I stopped when it was like five or six bucks a pack. I smoked for three years from the time I was 10 until I was uh, 13. Oh. I don't remember what the cost of cigarettes I, I was. I stole my cigarettes anyway. 13 to 37. 24 years I smoked. And wow. Now I have 22 years, or 20 years not smoking. I so. have 50. Yeah, 50 years. There you 50 go. 50 years, yeah. Yeah. So happy that uh, fortune befalled me, and, and that fortune was my, my cousin Keith Magnuson, uh, such a hard-working, <coughs> uh, not very talented hockey player. 
uh, worked his way into the NHL. Mm -hmm. Uh, made himself captain, or they made him captain of the Chicago Blackhawks, <coughs> later to become the first coach after Billy Ray. Uh, Keith changed my life. Um, he came around at that time when I was 13, and uh, he gave me equipment to play. He didn't come around, he sent me equipment through his brother Wayne in, in Alberta. And so I got to wear some of Keith's practice equipment uh, and play hockey. Keith's a big man, I was a little boy. <laughs> I'm sure it was funny to see me out there with all those pads. But that changed my life. That totally changed my life in, in, in two hockey related ways. One, because I had a family member who made me proud. Who made me proud. I could be a proud human being because I had a family member that made the National Hockey League. Mm -hmm. and, and that gave me something I really didn't have before. It was, was some self-worth, yeah. you know? And then the other one was that I started playing hockey. Yeah. And that got me a whole new group of friends. That yeah. got me a whole new path to take. <coughs> and and all, those two things totally changed my life. Mm -hmm. um, Keith, in his attitude, and also was a big part of it, right? Because he didn't have much talent. It wasn't like he was born, you know, with a silver puck in his mouth. No. Uh, he had to really work hard for every inch that he got. He had to fight his way into the NHL. Uh, he became a very steady, stay-at-home defenseman. Mm -hmm. uh, couldn't score a goal to save his life. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> you know, wouldn't have fared very well in today's NHL. None of them actually would have back in those days. I've been watching some old hockey. These days, wow, are we ever blessed to see a lot of extremely talented people yeah. working their tails off. Three of the Vancouver Twins just made it in the Hall of Fame. Yeah. Uh, and Longo uh, and the Sydney Twins. And Keith has had his number retired in Chicago. Yeah. Uh, you know, quite a... Quite an accomplishment for a man who really wasn't talented. And I, I say that with all due respect to Keith. I mean, he really didn't have a lot of hockey talent. Mm -hmm. But he was so tenacious, relentless, hardworking is, is, is an understatement to say the least. And that got him in. I mean, they, they saw that in him. They saw how, how hard he was willing to fight for what it was that he wanted to do. And he became their captain. And he led them to Stanley Cup Finals. And... You know, really had a, an amazing, wonderful career. And it was his hard work, his work ethic, mm -hmm. that, that really did so much good for me as well. You know, I mean, I took that uh, very seriously. And I remember when I was on the Freedom Tour, the first year I decided to go, you know, I, I, I had to, I, I practiced going downhill yeah. before I went on the Freedom Tour. Right? The idea of the Freedom Tour was to roller, roller blade to Ottawa. Wow. And... Uh, so I, I trained for that, you know, I mean, that, that's not anything you take lightly. I mean, there's the Rocky Mountains between me and Ottawa, right? Mm -hmm. And vast amounts of prairies. And then Ontario is as huge as all the rest of Canada. And so holy smokes, I mean, that was a, a huge undertaking and I trained for it. Mm -hmm. I trained for what to do going down hills because that's what I was afraid yeah. of. Was <coughs> going down hills, coming down the Rockies. Man, I sure should have trained for going uphill. <laughs> <laughs> Should have paid a little more attention to what that was going to be like. So I'm going uphill. Yeah. And all I could think about all the time going uphill, except for that last leg where Michelle Rainey, rest in peace, yeah. and rest in weed, and rest with all the rest of our great people there. Michelle, I love you forever. I'll always love you. Uh, Michelle Rainey called me when I was uh, most of the way up the Malahat Mountain Range. And I don't know if I was running out of gas or not. All the way up, all I could think about was Keith. I think about Keith running the, the stairs at the Chicago Stadium with, with weights on his ankles. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking, he can do that, I can do this, you know. But it was a tough sled for sure. I, like I said, my thoughts were, boy, I should have prepared more for you know, a lot of uphill. Yeah. And then Michelle Rainey called me. And somehow, talking to her, I didn't even realize I was still skating. And then, but, 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 there I was at the top. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You made it. You made but it, yeah. yeah, Keith had a huge impact on my life. Hockey had a huge impact on my life. And... Uh, I, I, I'm thankful for that. Uh, I, I, there's a price to pay yeah. for getting value out of things. You, you know, there's a yin and yang in this universe. So the price was is that I have to live in sports hell forever. Um, you know, I spent most of my life believing that the uh, the Canucks were going to win the Stanley Cup one day, and mm -hmm. I was going to be able to parade with them down the street. Yeah, uh, ten years ago, I well, twelve years ago, I realized that's never going to happen. Probably, you know, maybe. Maybe, but probably not. Probably not. Probably not to the point where I'm never going to count on it. I have no faith that it will ever happen, at least in my lifetime. Who knows what, 100 years from now. But in my lifetime, I can't see this team 
ever winning the Stanley Cup. I'm sorry for all you diehard fans that believe that you just have to believe all the time, but I don't know how long you're supposed to believe for. <laughs> you know, I don't know how many disappointments well, you're supposed to be able to hit take along the way. Weren't we talking about how the Toronto Argonauts have not played the Winnipeg Blues? Since 1950. Yeah, so 72 years out of an 18 league. <laughs> and was Doesn't there, make any was, sense. Was there 18 in 1952? Well, not more. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe less. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but that's how does that happen? I don't how understand that. that. How does that? How can that happen in an 18 league? that you can have two teams that don't play each other in the final for 72, 72 years. years. Or 70. When wow. it, or it 90, 50 years, or 72 and I hate years. to tell you, Toronto, but you're probably not winning. Oh, you know what? <laughs> you know, there are no, people I, in I Toronto just, are, are in a similar uh, a sports hell to okay. me. I'm not, I'm not sure what you guys did. I was born in Toronto. I've been to two Argos wings of the Great Cup. And I've been to and, BC and, Lions and, wings, yeah, too. And they have done some upsets. So Yeah, just and, a couple, though, for and, me and, yeah. in, in all those and years, too. We, we beat three times, so I think Toronto's going to stop them from being... being being three time winners, I think. I don't know. I don't know. I we'll don't see. We'll I see. Don't. I don't think we'll so. See, we'll see if that they, they, no, their quarterback hurt his uh, ankle too. We don't even know. He's, he's be probably there. better on one leg than the Toronto. <laughs> <laughs> Remember, he walked off the field. I don't. Yeah. <laughs> he, he tried to be better on one leg. <laughs> I'm not wishing Toronto ill or anything. No. But, uh, just my opinion, right? Yeah. These, we we talk truth and opinion on this show. They're two very different things. There are things oh, that yeah. are truths that, that we can pretty much verify and, and be, be, be firm about. And then there's my opinion and your opinion and the other opinions on the opinion show. Can... John West's opinion. <laughs> John West's <laughs> opinion. <laughs> I don't know if John's got any opinions. I don't know. None of your own anyway. Nothing. But Nothing. Opinions can become true. Oh, for sure. You might be right. You might, really you might right. be right. So there you go, right? But, so, until, so. but until it's, it's you know, until it's, until proven, it's proven, it's an opinion. It's just an opinion. <laughs> so please recognize, those of you in the audience watching, that uh, some of what we say here is the truth, and yeah. some of what we say here is just our opinions. It's not too hard to tell the difference most of the time. <laughs> Anyways, we were talking about Tubes and News, and we got off topic. We do that. Yes, so I put the GoFundMe up there. All right. All right. So Tubes and News. <laughs> yes. What that is, <laughs> is that... that uh, for years, the CSP has been uh, providing, uh, around this time of year, uh, socks for people because lots of people in this neighborhood need socks. I mean, if you're in a wealthy neighborhood, you don't need to be giving socks away to people. This is not a wealthy neighborhood. There's a lot of homeless and, and poor people that don't have proper socks out here. And they don't have proper shoes. Yeah. So because they don't have proper shoes, they wear their socks out or their socks get wet or their socks get destroyed. They need a nice, clean pair of dry socks. Yep. That's a good thing to do for people. We try to do more than just provide uh, compassion and cannabis for people here. We've been doing that right from the beginning. We take donations. We put out tables full of stuff all the time. Uh, there's lots of things that we do here. Uh, and this is one that I, I'm you know, particularly fond of. I've, yep. I've always liked the tubes and dubes. That Sterling started in Saskatoon. That's and, true. And this he, was an initiative of Sterling's yes. that we took he, under our own. His fifth year, our third year. Doing I it. See. Yes. Yeah. yes. Good Sterling. for you, Sterling. Sterling was the one who inspired us. He was the us inspiration the behind it. Yeah, to do this too, yes. So what we do is, is that uh, we get a whole bunch of socks and we get uh, a whole bunch of doobies. Yeah. And we combine those together with some hot chocolate. Mm -hmm. And uh, we provide muffins and other things to, as well. Mm -hmm. And we just help people. Yeah. We'll we be just, doing something hot and edible this year. Hot right. and edible. There and and so we're, you know, we won't say what because we're not sure what, but there no, will be no. some hot food uh, provided as well. And this will be five days before Christmas on December the 20th. So it'll yep. be nice. Right? And, and we're looking for some help with that. Yes. Uh, if you're looking for how you can help and what you can do in this world, well, here's something you can do. Uh, right now, it's out of Glenn's pocket. Yeah. Uh, we've got a GoFundMe page. We've uh, already got uh, 84 packs of warm socks from Cabela's. They gave us 20% off on that. Mm -hmm. But on it's that. almost a couple thousand dollars it's, at this uh, point. It's $1,700, and we'll be able to help. 320 people and, and that's the sock side of it a warm pair of socks the, C the csp will also be kicking in as always yep. uh, the doobies we give out free doobies here to everybody that asks all day long that's yep. one of the services we provide free muffin free cookie and a free doobie for people that need it tim hortons is going to match me with uh, one uh, uh thermos thing of hot chocolate and coffee i buy one and then they'll give me one so uh, so good on uh, tim hortons to, to, to mm -hmm. tim hortons for yeah. that yeah uh, yeah, so it's, it's and, and good. John Murray will be there also having yeah. something that he's going to provide uh, as always, and, and yeah. other people come out to, for these things as well. 
it's a really wonderful thing. Uh, please support uh, Tubes and Dudes. Please consider having a Tubes and Dudes event in your area, wherever that yeah, might be. You can just send five dollars. Other than if you're living in the rich places, yeah. in which case you could give out uh, mm -hmm. dubes and sunglasses or something like that. You know, maybe you rich people. Hats, gloves. I think sunglasses are important. Rich people might not realize the damage that can be done to your eyes. I, I I'm just kidding. I mean, I'm just kidding. I did the comment there, so you guys will all be able to just hit the link there. So Great. For the, the golf one. So if you're watching the show, it's available to you. Yep. And, and yeah, we would like some help with that one for sure. In 35 days, you would see a show and we'll, we'll show you. There's probably a combined four or $5,000 uh, you know, going to be put into this event. Hopefully. And uh, you know, it helps a lot of people that really need it at a very tough time of the year for, for people on the west coast here so that that's good for that um, now health canada are corrupt and full of crap and, and, and if you would like to prove me otherwise please do mr benoit seguin i i would love to stop talking about how you're delinquent in your job and you are not doing what you're supposed to do and you're allowing for people to die that don't need to die i would love for you to prove me wrong on that but Health Canada has proven to be extremely corrupt, only interested in the financial health of the, of the government cartel stores. And, uh, and so those people are putting out a, a biased survey. If you look at the survey and see how the questions are structured and framed, you'll realize that this is a corrupt group that are trying to eliminate the sick people's access to cannabis and, and to keep up the system that we have right now. So please, before the 21st of November this month, we don't have much time at all. There's like six, six, more, more, days. six more days. Please take an hour out of your time, put on some music, smoke a doobie, go to the website, do the Health Canada the survey, and, and tell them what you think. And then, not a chance, but maybe. If enough people voice proper, reasonable concerns, maybe it'll make a difference. Or maybe they've already got their minds made up about what their future agenda is, is how they're going to move legalization forward. And it won't matter how many of us write good things to them. But we can't, we can't bank on that. That's no way to live. That's no way to do it, to just give up and say, oh, well. We all have to at least try. We should do our best. And then... If it doesn't work out, at least you tried. At least you did your best. So please take part in that survey November 21st um, and, uh, and let Health Canada know that uh, this legalization does not allow for low barrier access. That's the number one main important thing to understand is that the people that need it, that have barriers to getting it, need to have those barriers removed. We need to have a price that people can pay. We need to have people be able to access without ID, without credit cards, without bank accounts, all of those things. Uh, and there's no reason why you can't. You don't need any of those things to go into almost any store and buy almost anything that they have for sale there. So there's no reason that you can't also uh, access link, cannabis. Link is there. The link is there. Yep. Well, I guess we're getting time for uh, what we need to do there, right? Uh, we talked about the Thornton Park raid. We talked about the court coming up tomorrow in Vancouver here at 222 Main Street. Uh, we talked about uh, Erica's uh, ediblecalendar.com, uh, the Off the Hill event that's coming up on Rabble, the Tubes and Dubes, yep. and about the RV being torched the other night. Yes. And, uh, mm -hmm. We're going to go out there. We're going to visit with the uh, people that are out there manning the CSP uh, Healing Wave tent and uh, give you a little slice of that. We'll see you next week, sir. Oh, yeah? Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much, Glenn. No problem. Couldn't do it without you. Pretty sure of that. Yeah, i got to get on the camera when you go outside now. How do you have a session of smoking weed if you're all by yourself? Well, I oh, guess you can do I that. Can we could do that. I'm right here. I just make stuff Did up. Did you say smoke going. weed? Let's do that. I got my mm -hmm. coat on now. Now I'm ready so, to dash outside. I got my coat on. I'm open. You're ready to go, and I'm ready to fill people in. Okay. So if you're just tuned in for the first time to this show, and you're really not sure what we're talking about with the CSP and the Healing Wave, well, for the last several years in, in North America here, we've been under the scourge of a public health emergency, which is a poisoned drug supply and an alarming number of people dying from that, uh, that uh, poisoned drug supply. And with my background, I understood that cannabis high-dose edibles were effective for many people in getting through withdrawal. And so back in 2016, around this time, 
Uh, I started going to first uh, VANDU, the Vancouver Area Network of Drug Users Organization, funded by government to, as an advocacy group for uh, the people oppressed by the drug war. And they gave me unanimous approval for my idea of making it as easy as possible for people to get high dose edibles. Um, and from there I took that support and went to the City Council of Vancouver and pitched the idea to them of a real safe supply of cannabis high dose edibles. Don't have any right here. Oh yeah, do it. This is the real safe supply. There you go. They talk about safe supply all the time. Okay. The safe supply is not really more opioids that keep you addicted and you can overdose on, whether it's poisoned or not. The real safe supply is cannabis to use for your, the pain or whatever it is you're trying to use it for. And, and if you need stronger than smoked cannabis, well, there's edibles and there's concentrates, and it's not hard to find, and you can, anybody can find a dose of cannabis concentrates and edibles that can help them with their pain, similarly to how opioids help you with your pain. Um, I said before right off the top that if you're having a limb amputated, probably an opioid is a better idea for the, uh, the three months there, but you need to be uh, weaned off properly and you need to get off those things before you spend any more time on there. And three months is actually a very long time, more like six weeks. Um, it would be the kind of the limit that I would, uh, you know, myself Opioids. allow myself to be on those things from if I had to have a limb amputated or something like that. But for the most part, for people who are dealing with uh, long-term chronic pain, who are dealing with uh, emotional distress and pain, uh, you can find the right level of high dose edibles or, or, or edibles. They don't have to be high dose for some people for sure. You can find the right dosage of edibles. So edibles is the right thing to be using. And the doctors have been going to opioids for all of these years. And now we have all of these people addicted to opioids, the visible ones on the streets of the downtown east side and the invisible ones that are in all of our communities throughout all the demographics of people. And many of them are dying from having to come down here to get their drugs because they can't any longer steal from their family or family members won't give it to them and their doctors have cut them off and all those other reasons. And, and, and the biggest reason of all is, is that they don't want anybody to know that they've got this little habit going on that is so frowned upon and stigmatized in our society. So once a person gets themselves addicted to opioids and the doctors take you off but you're not off, they don't want anybody to know about that and they live secretly for a long time. It gets worse and it gets worse and they end up down here buying their drugs and then they end up using alone because nobody can know. And then they end up dying alone because that's just what's happening here. So we took all that information to city council and had them uh, not be interested at all. I told the VPD board with my lawyer, or with a lawyer, what it is that we were going to do and got a pretty good response from them. They said there wasn't much they could do for us, but they understood that what we were doing was trying to help and they thanked me for that. And we didn't get much interference from them for most of the time that we were doing this. That's another story. But that began, began the cannabis substitution program. And upon doing those things and then securing enough donations, I went about giving them out at Van Du. And after giving them out at Van Du for four weeks in a row on a Saturday at noon, I ended up with a huge lineup of people and a handful of volunteers there to meet me on that fourth Saturday at noon, where I had never told anybody when I was coming back or anything. Yeah. I, that was just a pattern that I, that I got into. Yeah. And that was the cannabis substitution program. So we started handing out care packs of high dose edibles. Uh, we had John and another group come in on a couple of different times. We were there twice a week for the last two and a half years. And so every Sunday, John would come <coughs> with some sort of hot infused food. And we had Mackenzie and, and her spouse, uh, Evan, who was a chef, mm -hmm. preparing other hot meals for people on, on the Thursdays there. And so uh, we ran this program and it didn't take too long for people to take notice because we were giving out hundreds every, every time we were there. And uh, Dr. MJ Malloy sent researchers down to collect data on what we were doing. And, and many people were reporting to their doctors and to city council about the value of the program that we had started there to the point where the city council finally did after two and a half years pass a motion to support what we were doing, calling it low barrier access. Um, upon meeting with the city and finding a storefront, we moved in and started providing not just no-cost cannabis, but at that point also low-cost cannabis on our end because we needed money to be able to rent the store and pay for staff and, and all the other costs of running a business. But what we also learned from that is that there's a huge population of people who need to have discrete low-barrier access 
because they're that group that don't want anybody to know and they just need to be able to come in get some information get some high dose edibles and go get themselves through withdrawal and that they're not going to join a program like we had going where people would get 420 milligrams every four days that's a group of people a very vulnerable group of people that are dying in large numbers and they need to be reached they need to be able to have easy access to high dose cannabis edibles so that's what we've been doing ever since that dates back over two and a half years now since uh, we and, and and actually it's only uh, two two and a half two years six months and six days is when we opened the store but five and a half months later we were evicted because the city refused to give us a license until health canada did and our lawyer fearing threats from the city and the original ones there weren't follow-up ones but there was that original threat and his lawyers convinced him that they should try to evict us and so we were evicted we bought an rv we parked the rv out front and we used that as our base of operation our low barrier access point for people for over two years. November 1st was the two year anniversary of using the RV. And uh, since then we've had some troubles, but I don't need to go into any of that. Uh, we've discussed it on other shows, but we are before the courts uh, as the, uh, the, the, the VPD brass did decide after well over a year and a half of what we were doing in the RV that they needed to charge us uh, on behalf of the Canadian government with uh, selling cannabis without a license. And so we are in court tomorrow on that one and uh, hopefully going to set a date tomorrow for a pre-trial conference where this should all stop when uh, an actual wise adjudicator gets to hear what it is that the Crown thinks are the reasons why we should be punished and stop doing what we're doing and we get to present our side of it. Uh, we'll see how that goes. But in any case, uh, we've had a horrible event happen. Um, up until this show, we have always been able to go outside and visit the people in the RV and around the RV and, uh, and get a little taste of what it's like to, to have a, an RV to sell cannabis out of. But because we've obviously ruffled the feathers of some of the competition in the neighborhood, be it those people trying to sell cannabis at higher prices or those people that are not wanting to lose customers to the cannabis substitution program, but those are the only groups that make any sense of who would go to the lengths that they've now gone to after uh, several break-ins and having our van trashed on the inside for no good reason every time and now uh, we've had someone torch the RV um, I, I'm, I'm beyond words for it uh, it was a, a fire bomb that sent it up in, in billowing flames in no time uh, had we had anybody still in the RV, and I had had someone sleep overnight in the RV the night before that who confronted a person breaking in, who yelled on their way out that they were going to torch our van, firebomb our van. And so we don't have an RV to go and look at right now. Uh, but we're still here, and we're not going to go anywhere. We cannot stop. We will not stop, even if it's only just me. But for now, I've got a whole bunch of very dedicated people who are willing to be out here helping even though we know there's an unknown threat of somebody who doesn't want us here and is willing to go to some pretty large violent lengths to get us to be gone we really can't stop doing what we're doing we're going to be doing it in a much more secure fashion uh, than what we're doing right now and that what we were doing in the past that's the only answer that i can see is that uh, if we do get another vehicle we're going to have to have overnight security uh, you know round the clock watching what's going on there and, uh, and we will do that. Uh, we'll find a way to do that. Anyway, let's go, uh, let's go see the folks outside. I'll take my, uh, my mustache toker with me, or maybe no, I won't. <coughs> see it? I don't know where that went. I had it there. Yeah. I haven't seen it all show. It was right there before the show. So I don't know. Maybe it's right oh, there it is. There it is. Oh, okay. There it is. Very good. What's um, left of it? There you go. This was the uh, mustache toker made by Gibson Glass. By the way, these are amazing, except they break. He does make <laughs> ones, glass. He, he does make ones that don't break, and he was going to give me one of those. And Gibby, if you're watching, I could sure use one because this is the one I got at the Mom Cop as a donation to me by yeah. by by Sita, who you know, bless her heart. Uh, heard what I had to say about, uh, you know, my, my love for these things and how they break all the time. Uh, they're still usable. So the mustache is gone. Most of the handle is gone. 
but you can still stick a doobie in the end and light it up and not burn your fingers or your lips. <laughs> well, the uh, weekly Vancouver weather report is, it's dark. <laughs> Uh, it, it's, uh, it wasn't cloudy today to any great extent. It was actually a quite a mild day. Uh, you can still see your breath, but uh, uh, Mother Nature or the Good Lord or whoever is looking after us uh, is still looking after us because now that we no longer have the RV uh, and we're going to be doing this out from underneath a tent, uh, we really need to have a little milder weather than we've had in the last couple of weeks. So good on Mother Nature. <coughs> I really don't have words. No, I know. I, I really don't it's, it's know gone. what to say. This is where it was. Um, a picture tells a thousand stories or a, says a thousand mm -hmm. words. This RV is much easier on gas. It's considerably more air conditioned, although that's not a, a feature in the winter time. But that's what we have. Welcome to the Healing Wave CSP tent. Tent. And, uh, well, are you are you willing to be on camera? This is Pot TV. Oh. Yeah, I'm not going to be on camera. That's just okay. the two of you right now. That's why we didn't put you on. No. But he's asked the question, where's the RV? The RV was firebombed uh, Sunday night uh, by people who had threatened us the night before that they were going to do that. And uh, yeah, they, they blew it up real good. And so we're under a tent again until we get another vehicle or find a different way that's uh, more secure from whoever it is that doesn't want us in the neighborhood. They firebombed it? They firebombed it. They've been breaking in. We'd had the six break-ins in the previous few weeks. We had three in a row uh, to the point where I had someone stay in the RV on Saturday night. They broke in again that night and uh, was confront were confronted. And on the way out, they said, I'm gonna firebomb your, IV your RV next time I come by. And 17 hours later, 10 minutes after we left at the end of the day at seven o'clock, it was up in flames. We have witnesses that say two people pulled open the back doors, threw in a Molotov cocktail, and boom, in no time it was fully engulfed. You wouldn't believe the scene. So here we are wondering, you know, how to proceed, and uh, so far we're going to do this until uh, I make a better decision than this, but uh, that's what we're doing. So how you been doing, Kev? Oh, not too bad. I was actually in the oh, yeah, that was in the, in the, in the I, I didn't that. want to tell you, tell them unless you wanted to. Yeah. And, uh, it was Kevin who was in the RV. Yeah. Uh, he let his cat stay in the shop, thankfully. Yeah. So his cat was also not in the RV that night. Wow, yeah. But uh, Kevin was going to be good enough to, to, to stay there and see if somebody would break in again three nights in a row. And sure enough, they did. Yeah. So, uh, buddy, you know. Thank you. All kudos to you. Thank you so much. Hey, I'm just and now glad. here you are out there, man, in the table. I, I'm just glad that you know nobody like yeah, you, yes. like you said. It was about ten minutes after, no. so like ten minutes time, just and they would have murdered four people and killed the dog. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah if they'd have done that so yeah. ten minutes earlier, yeah. Sure. yeah, they would have all been inside and murdered. <laughs> anyway, carry on. We've got people uh, yeah, needing I'm your services, so I'm going to let that go. Um, hey. You know, what the, you know what the greatest thing is, Neil? The, you know, the, the one thing is that I find more better than anything else. You've got such a heart of gold that you're still giving away free joints and free edibles to anybody downtown east side that needs it. Man. That's the job of the CSP. That's, that's what we have crazy. to do. We, we can't not help these people. Yeah. Like, they rely on us. They've come to rely on us. This is something that, that is, is real. Like, what are we supposed to do? Just stop because a corrupt government says, oh, well, all your supply isn't legal and all these people don't have a doctor saying it's okay for them to use this stuff? For that, we're supposed to stop doing what we're doing? Well, that's not reasonable. That would be cruel and unusual to expect human beings like us in the situation that we're in, helping the people that we've been helping in the situation that they're in, stop doing that. That would be cruel and extremely unusual. And that's what I was about to say is that this is mind-boggling. This is horrifying. I would have never guessed that after, because I knew we would prove that cannabis could help people. I knew that. That was, that was already in my knowledge banks. And that if we proved it, that we would get government cooperation. That we wouldn't have to worry about arrest and courts and firebombs and thefts and all of these things. That, that we would be 
given a, a store to operate out of and people would have their dignity protected by governments who are supposed to care. And, and they're not really, in my opinion, supposed to care so much for all those people who can care for themselves. I think really that the, the role of government in my understanding and, and what I think it should be is where all of us who can look after ourselves have a government who looks after those that can't look after themselves. That's what our tax dollars should be going towards. Sure, we need roads, we need good education for our kids. The medical care system, although highly overfunded and under underserving in this country, is still a wonderful thing. We need all of that. But first and foremost, isn't it the, the ones amongst us, our brothers and sisters and sons and daughters and uncles and aunts that can't look after themselves or maybe don't have family? I mean, I call them brothers and sisters and sons and daughters because we're all family. There's a lot of people who really don't have family. There's a lot of people who don't have friends. And they've had life smack them right upside the head. We have veterans, many veterans amongst our homeless. That's disgusting. I heard there was 23,000 veterans who've had limbs blown off and other serious injuries that are fighting our government for proper compensation. I want a government that looks after the people that can't look after themselves. I want to take some of my money and give it to them in ways that are really going to help them. That's what we should have going on. But for almost six years, man, we're coming up to some real anniversaries here. It was six years ago now that I went to Van Du. It was six years ago in two weeks that I, or, or a week rather, that I went to City Council. And it was a week after that that I went to the VPD. And it's coming up in February, six years, that we have been demonstrating how effective this is for people. There is no question amongst this neighborhood, amongst all of the other harm reduction groups, that this is by far the best harm reduction option. This is what this neighborhood needs, is to have easy access in storefronts, in numerous locations where it's needed. This is the best harm reduction option, and we have proven it beyond any shadow of any doubt. My lawyer said to me a while ago, there's no point in us sending any more of the science to Health Canada, because they already know. We've already proven it beyond a shadow of a doubt with real science, with peer-reviewed science about how cannabis can be effective for people in getting them through withdrawal. We've proven it long time ago. We proved it. Dr. M.J. Malloy started putting out his dozens and dozens of studies on this years ago. Yet Health Canada does nothing but make excuses, come up with stupid, unjustified reasons why they won't support us, and delay, delay, delay. They've never even come here to see for themselves. They say that we could get an exemption from Health Canada's Cannabis Act if we qualify in three areas. But Health Canada says we don't qualify in those areas. The areas are, is it in the public's interest? Is it about public health and safety? And the third one is, is it about research? And they say we wouldn't qualify for an exemption based on any of those three criteria, you only need one. You're telling me this is not in the public's interest during a health care crisis? A public health emergency? This is not in the public's interest to provide a solution for maybe only even a percentage of those that are afflicted and afflicting everybody else in the process? You're telling me this isn't about public health and safety? I don't even need to explain that one. <laughs> Holy smokes. We did re research with Respawi. I think we might have some of the earlier books still that weren't in the RV. We lost a bunch when the, the VPD took our RV back in May and gave it back to us. We didn't get the, the records back. We continued to take all the data that we could from the members that are here about what it is that they're taking and how it's working for them. All burned up in the RV. Oh, God. But you're telling me that this can't be about research? You're telling me that Health Canada couldn't use what we've got going on here to research what's going on with this public health emergency? We're bringing in hundreds of people from the neighborhood 
that are the very people at the core of this public health emergency. Those visibly addicted, those people living in poverty, the people without housing, these are the people that our government should be caring about. And they've never even come here from their ivory towers in Ottawa to have a look at what we're doing, to see how it works, and maybe take a few notes, or a lot of notes. It's disgusting. It's discouraging, but I will not stop. I am not so discouraged by all of this that we will stop. And I don't mean I, I mean we. I am not alone in this at all. I'm, I'm surrounded by many, many people who help me every chance they get, who ask if they can help us in what we are doing here, who keep me going, who I have to keep going for. This is much larger than one person. We are a society of people in the Serious Hope Society, and we are a society of people in this society. And we can't get our public servants to serve those people who need it the most. That is very disturbing and disgusting. We're back in court tomorrow. Nine o'clock, you can meet out front with us. We'll have a, a sacred meeting. Inhale some of the magical vapors of the sacred herb. Contemplate proceedings about to happen. And then join us in court and watch this spectacle of corruption expose itself as Health Canada and the federal government are on trial here. And they're about to be indicted seriously. Come help us. Come watch with us. Join us, please. I thank everybody who's watching the show today. I thank Cannabis Culture and Pot TV for giving me this platform. My special guest and producer, Glenn Wells. <laughs> and all of those other people that are around us. Somebody As I always say, mostly the donators to keep things going here. The donations is what the CSP runs on. And thanks to so many people who have blessed us over these years, we've been able to sustain it because of that. Thank you all to all of those people. To all of you doing anything to, to help us, thank you. And uh, if you haven't helped, it's okay, because there's still time. There's still, you can still write that letter or make that phone call or do whatever it is that you can do to help. So be part of the team. Let's move freedom forward for the generations to come. And the most important thing always, no matter what, Life is too serious to take serious. Have as much fun as you can. I'll see you next week.